bit of, I'm sure there'll be people in my household that will come knocking. So uh, just, just don't worry about that part. Okay. So can you see my screen? I think it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's good. Good? Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much. It won't be uh, too formal, this particular presentation, but uh, let's, let's continue on and enjoy it. So in terms of, uh, just switch over. So who am I? And I'll just give you a, a quick sort of a quick sort of run through on that. Uh, so I'm a, a CTO of, of MOQ Digital, and uh, that's what I do during my daytimes. Uh, see a lot of customer engagement, follow them right through from architecting through to implementation, execution, delivery, and talk to the business around a lot of where the business value is in what we're doing. I love technology, you know, developer, integrator, coder, previous life, uh, computer engineer, things like that. So I've also been an MVP for over 11 years and in the recent three years uh, been an Azure MVP and, and that's certainly a place that uh, is really exciting and as you know it's, it's really changing the landscape of what we, we do as a collective today. And uh, you know, keeps us keeps us uh, interested, gives us a you know fantastic opportunity. Just the rate of change of, of you know cloud technologies, with uh, Scott Guthrie saying a little while ago that uh, there's a major new release every two days in in the cloud. So as a builder, as a systems integrator, or an architect, or a builder, it's such a compelling environment that you know it would be foolish to ignore it. I'm also doing Movember as well, so uh, if, if you could see me right now, then uh, it's, it's quite an interesting one. I'll, I'll just give you a quick run through of uh, my family, and this is the person that uh, chases me around the house these days with the clippers to uh, try and get rid of my, my beautiful growth. And uh, so that there is, uh, is uh, my oldest and uh, grandma, and, and what grandma can say in uh, maybe two Two minutes takes me about two weeks, and uh, this one here is just this is India just the other day. She um, she came up with the Hello Windows, and I've just got that on my Surface Pro 4. That basically needs your facial recognition to sit in front of it, and she was the one that just said, "Oh, Dad, you you weren't at your computer, so I just held a photo up of you on my phone, and it let me in." Now <laughs> that's not meant to happen, and uh, this there is. Uh, my, my golden retriever honey and uh, she's about the only one that listens to me in the family. All right, she loves the water too, as much as what I do. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, solutions, you know, how do we connect? So that's always the big question up front. How do we know that we're going to be doing the right thing and, and how do we know that we're not going to come unstuck down the track? So there's, you know, certain technologies that work really well, certain approaches that work really well. And, and the classic thing to keep an eye out to also is, and we've heard it so many times before, works well on my machine as a developer. All right, so, so if you're testing out code and you're, you're running one or two clients against you know, your web endpoint or whatever it might be, it, it works beautifully. Right? We, we all know this. So how, do, how can we pick the best technology of the bunch? And this is where I think you know, I get I get excited about Service Fabric um, because it, it's quite an underlying uh, technology, and I personally think it's a real game changer in what we do and, and what we see you know, coming up down the track. So here's what I'm thinking of, of going through, and uh, really, you know, some interesting points on that piece. And if I'll just switch over, is things like you know. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, folks. How does that? There we go. Let me, let me do that. There we go. Early morning, early morning trouble. Um, so basically, upgrading applications with no downtime. So you think about that. You know, a lot of the clients these days, and about the last, all my clients are basically telling me, Mick, we need a solution where we don't need to have an outage window. These systems are getting so important and customers, clients, 
B2B, downstream, whatever it might be, are demanding that our services are there. So how can we ensure that that uh, we we you know, that we don't have downtime? And I'm you know, having many many years of, of biz talk over 15 years of biz talk. We always have this, you know, we need an outage, we need to deploy, we need to upgrade, and, and an upgrade is very complex based on you know what the artifacts are that you're going to be upgrading. Are they shared? Are they standalone? And, and how do we best architect our BizTalk application so that we minimise the impact of that? So that in itself is quite an interesting feature that we can do out of this thing called Service Fabric. So let's move on to what is Service Fabric. Okay. So what is Service Fabric? And uh, in a nutshell, micro, you, you've all heard of uh, you know, the Azure fabric and how it manages and handles VMs and our various cloud services and, and instances of, of uh, you know, web apps and things like this. And so there's the notion of uh, you know, if I have two or more VMs uh, in sort of availability groups and things like this, that they're going to be on different racks and they're going to be in different parts of the Azure data center or region and uh, there's going to be a degree of protection around them. So what Microsoft have done is to take that goodness of, of what we call the Azure fabric and bring that into our application land. So it's quite interesting. So we, we, get, a, we get all of these features in the application space and that's exactly what I'm going to show you today. So before we get there, um, things like we'd like to go out and develop an application, we'd like to develop a system. So what we're really interested in and what we think is, is really cool is basically the, the feature set. So that's what we sit there you know, around the pub one night going, wouldn't it be good if, and you know, out we went with, with a whole bunch of features. To actually deploy that application as a cloud-based system or, or that you know, our services are going to be used by you know, mobility clients, really there, there's a whole raft of other aspects and possibilities that you need to think about, which is really this side of, this side of the, the, the pole. So you know, great, we can build any, feature, any service with a bunch of features in it. So but what about scalability? You know, it works well on my machine, right? So you've got one person using it or two people using it. Suddenly they bring it up on their, on their phone and they're tapping away on it. Works fantastically. What about if five people, 10 people, 200 people, 2,000 people? What are, what are our, our, our notions for that? What, what's our plan? So we've all, you, you've all probably heard of you know, auto scale in, uh, in Azure where we can auto scale. So in, in the systems that we build, so I've, I've got a lot of experience around high volume, near real time, mission critical systems, which, you know, if you think about all the all the ticks in boxes that keep you up at night and make you worried and, and give you grey hair, then, then they're pretty much there, right? Uh, so, you know, how do we plan for that? So we, we might think of auto scale. I'm going to turn on auto scale in Azure. The sampling set is five minutes as, as it stands today. So every five minutes, it'll sample um, you know, the, the resources, CPU, queues, things like that. And if they obey your, your auto-scale rules, then your instance will be auto-scaled. And realistically, it's probably about another five minutes after that to, or ten minutes to when you start to see that instance come into play. So significant delay on that. So if you think about sites like eBay, if you think about auction sites where, you know, the, the thing with user, uh, end user type systems and mobility is that in one minute you might have 20 users con concurrently hitting the, the services and in the next instance you might have 200, 2,000, 5,000. So how do, we, how do we plan for that without having, you know, 100 odd instances on hot standby churning up uh, resources. So there's a whole series, series of other things in there as well, such as you know, latency. We, we always want to build low latency type systems, 
We want to build simple systems. So there's a, what I'm really pointing out here is that there's a lot more than just the feature set. And, and we know that from our you know, non-cloud-based applications as well, that when we deploy into production, what about things like logging, fault tolerance, uh, you know, making them hardened, recoverable. And one of the things that I tell my teams is that when we start to develop for the cloud, we develop for survival. And in the sense of the, our code has to be up and running. It has to be recoverable. Uh, it's you know, it's a lot more difficult. We we can obviously can do it, but it's a lot more difficult to go away and and restart the thing. Um, you know, we build for survival. I don't want to have to go to, to all my deployments in the cloud and touch them. You know, that's kind of that's going to be a nightmare. So enter this this service fabric. So. I put a lot of this, uh, a lot of info in these slides for you. Don't don't worry about too much of it. Um, you can grab the slide deck after. So we have this notion of service fabric, which is the the purple, uh, the the purple box through here. Now, in this, we have a lot of features. The part that gets really exciting about this, and and above that, we have the notion of microservices, and that's been that term has been thrown around a lot. But you can think of as a monolithic application broken down into smaller bits, and they're that's basically our classes and and so forth. If you're familiar with you know various programming models, and we then have a whole series of services that are baked into this thing called service fabric. So over on the right hand side, I'm just going to pull out a couple here, which is things like self healing. Sounds good. Pretty yeah, pretty pretty interesting. Also things like load balancing. So if you think about the features that you get in Azure Fabric, you're getting these features as part of your application domain. For those of you that are, I suppose, uh, old enough to remember a, a feature set called uh, called Com Plus, then uh, yeah, there was an environment where my, you know, where the system created. Uh, a certain environment. We then created our, our classes, we annotated them a particular way and we deployed them into this environment called COM Plus and certain things were given for us. Now, same sort of notion here with Service Fabric that if we can create our widgets and at this point we call them microservices, uh, if we can create those and deploy them into Service Fabric, we then get a whole bunch of things. So interesting uh, aspect over here of hybrid operations. So if we if we pull down just to the next layer, we have some clouds that we run this on. One being Azure, one being other clouds, and one being, for example, my own servers, my laptop sitting in front of me, for example. So this piece of technology known as service fabric, I can I can deploy and spin up in Azure. I can also deploy and spin up in other clouds and I can deploy and spin up in my own data center or on my own servers. So that in itself gets me quite excited given the amount of work that we have to do for customers when we build hybrid type solutions and we have on-premises technologies, we have cloud technologies and if you, you know, as much as we try to sort of you know, make it seem as seamless and possible and you know, being a 10 minutes in the oven, we're building a recipe and it looks like this on the Jamie Oliver show. Never happens for me, right? But, uh, you know, as much as we try and do that, there's still little nuances, little differences that are out there, such as, you know, we, we build web applications, we build cloud services, and, and the way we deploy a cloud service is slightly different to a web application, which is slightly different to how we would do it on premises. So. How can we, you know, streamline that as easy as possible? Because, you know, my particular view is that customers will, they're, they're very excited about, uh, you know, about the cloud. They'll adopt it where it makes sense. And it may be in all. They may be, you know, throwing a whole bunch of things into the cloud or they may not be. And, and that's fine, right? It's all about just using the right tool to get for, for the problem. So if, we, if we're looking at these particular different clouds that we have, then the exciting part is that up here I might have, and we'll call it a package, right? This, this thing that I'm going to deploy. 
if uh, I've got a, a, a package that we're going to deploy, the same package can go and run on, on my servers in front of me in Azure and also in other clouds such as AWS and so on. So that's quite an interesting proposition. I, I don't think I've seen a technology to date that lets us do that as easily. So we, we enter into sort of the world of, of the container world and, and so on. The other little part here that's, that's also very exciting is this Linux window. So this is certainly a new face of Microsoft, certainly to me in the last three years, which is, hey, we're open. We're going to allow you to run this on Linux. So if you've got Linux deployments, you can run what we're talking about here today as well. So it's quite interesting. So look, in short, there's a whole bunch of uh, features and functionality out of this platform. So let's go and explore and, and allows us to uh, run it in a variety of different places. So let's go and explore a little bit more about this Service Fabric. So Service Fabric is, is exactly what has been out and about in Azure for the last five years. So if you look at uh, Azure, so that particular technology has been running Service Fabric is the thing that provides all of the pieces of when we, when we have our connections and they go through. And so is this a scalable technology? Yes, it is. And you know, it, it's great that it's not something new. It's been a think tank in, in Microsoft research in the last couple of months. It's actually been baked into Azure for the last five years. Certainly a benefit as well. Microsoft have done recently into an API programming model for us to use. So in, in short, what is a, a microservice? So a microservice, a component, if you want to think of it that way, that's got state and we can deploy, independently deploy it, version it and scale. And, and we can go off and call other microservices as well. And just take note of that address there around Fabric and you know, so we can get to it via a unique, call it a URL for, for this point in the game. I should note that with um, Service Fabric, there has been a private um, from the Azure team for the last oh, eight months. You know, we can all go and get the bits and we can all go and play with it and I'll show you where to get those from in the tick. So about stateless, you, you might be familiar with cloud services, web apps and things and we're pretty good at building stateless apps because that's the programming model that we've had in the past for uh, you know, quite some time around well don't maintain state and your web front ends and, and so on. We can also go and build stateful applications. So things like, you know, shopping carts, user profiles. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we work with that? And I'll show you some some great slides coming up shortly. And yeah, you know, .NET is not the only language. So you know, Node.js, uh, yeah, and and various others as well. So very interesting. You know, once again, the new face of Microsoft being able to open up the technology stacks to you know, a wider variety of uh, different development platforms and frameworks. So how do we go and, uh, how do we go and install it? So you can certainly get to it from the um, web PI. So you can grab it there and go and install it. And then uh, essentially from a developer perspective, I can go and run a dev cluster setup which sets up five nodes on my machine in front of me. So pretty easy to go and fetch and uh, we can scale that out and so on. So let's peel back the covers a little bit and the part that I want to uh, just draw further reference to, we're, we're just expanding this open and we start to see some of the APIs here. So we start to see this reliable actors API and a reliable services API that sits above the service fabric. So service fabric 
has got, yeah, as you can see, a whole bunch of features in it. With my code, I can talk, the more I know about Service Fabric, I can reference the APIs and I can talk more lower level. And I can even influence some of these placements, you know, some, of, some of the things that, that Service Fabric might be doing on my behalf. So I can go and start to talk to these guys and, and say, hey, I'd like you to place me over here or here's some particular constraints. So in the land of, uh, you know, in the land of, of Azure and Azure Fabric, so when we go to create our VMs, this is what the Azure Fabric does for us. So we might have some large VMs and it works out optimally where to place the VM in the, in the region in the data center, so in that particular domain, so that uh, you know it distributes and spreads the load out. So we can do exactly that for our application space. Now, in terms of the rely the actors and the services APIs, the actor API is a simpler um, API to use. That if you just want to harness Service Fabric, you don't know too much about it. It's, it's essentially a class and you can just annotate a class in a certain way. Um, if I'm wanting to dig deep and control a few more things, then I'd go and use the services API itself. So the, the reliable actor API, uh, essentially I've just got a, a few bits and pieces here. So one of the, one of the points that I want to uh, just make note of here is that it's a single threaded, uh, single threaded execution. So if you're familiar with STA, so back in the day if we had COM, we had uh, MTA, FTA, STA. So single threaded apartments and things. So what Service Fabric looks after for us is to make sure that one thread executes our, our actor method at a time. Now, nothing is stopping us from having 5,000 actors, okay? But just to give you a bit of an idea that you know, right from the, the get-go, uh, the actors are being looked after and managed for us. If you're familiar with a game of uh, Halo 5 on the Xbox, that uses Service Fabric actors to represent each player in the, in the game. So just to, give you, just to give you a bit of an idea around that. So, I will bring into play, enter demo one. So, so that would be the wrong screen, Nick. All right, so I'm, let me bring that over to here. All right, so I'm in Visual Studio. I've got the bits already installed in uh, on my machine. And uh, so I'll just bring up a new project here for the moment. Oh, how about that? Never happens, right? It's opened up right on the uh, right in the bit that I need. I'm just waiting for little icons to show up, but they probably won't on this screen for some reason. But uh, there's little icons here that show up, so I can go off and I can create a service fabric cloud application. So I'm just going to call it application one, or not. Okay, for some reason, Houston, I have a slight problem. Okay, let me, uh, how about that, I just can't get off. All right, but uh, my screen appears to have, uh, my presenting screen appears to have locked up. Let me just see if I can do that. Awesome. Not there. Okay, I can use... Real. Okay, I can uh, I can use the keys to try and all right. So hopefully uh, hopefully you can still see the Visual Studio screen. 
Hey Mick, we can still see everything okay. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, all right, so I'm just gonna let's try that one more time. Because I do want to magic. Magic. All right. So <laughs> Yep. Okay. So uh I can go and create a service. Now, the thing that I can create over here uh, is I've got my services, I've got my actors, and you can see that I can even host an entire website inside this particular, uh, this particular technology. So we can go and create that. Now, the, if we look at the stateless side of things, they're very similar to you know, the cloud services that you know today, that we've got today. Um, so really the interesting ones are the stateful, the stateful ones. So I'm just going to show you one that I've already built. So when we go through and, and, can, and hit OK on that, I get four different, uh, four different uh, projects here. This particular project is one that allows me to deploy my application into the Service Fabric environment. I've then got two down here, which is actually the actor at my service fabric application. And I've also got my interface declaration. So if you think about you know, Microsoft and how they're going to surface this technology to us, we've got our classes that we go and create. And in this case, we explicitly go and declare interfaces so that clients who are proxying, who are going to be calling these particular classes or actors, uh, are basically going to be, you know, going through those interfaces. So we declare an interface, and uh, yeah, here I've just called, uh, I've declared it as actor stateful, you know, I actor stateful, and it's a counter interface. It's a very sim simple interface which it follows the async uh, programming model. We can call these anything really. Uh, it's just that when you run through that particular um, project template. It'll come back and call them, call them um, uh, stateful. No, sorry, async. Now, I've also got the uh, the, the task, you know, async type programming model, and that's it. So here I've got a get counter and I've got a set counter type method. So, in terms of the the magic, where does the magic happen? And I'll show you. Uh, this guy here. So this is our, our program. Um, first thing I, I start up with is the uh, and this looks very much like an entry point into uh, yeah, something like a, a console application or so. And that's exactly it, that when we do run these things run in their own process. And uh, so all it's doing here is just starting up, registering itself with a fabric runtime and just basically sitting in an infinite loop. Uh, so it's, uh, it's basically there. So in terms of the, the class itself, so the class itself is pretty simple and I'm just going to minimize this down. So the first thing that it does is to inherit from stateful actor as opposed to just actor. Um, and uh, the next thing you can see there in the, in the bracket, the type is what sort of state would you like to, uh, would you, would you like to save? And that's where we annotate our particular class. So the, uh, where are we? there we go. So the, what is in my class, you can see, is that it borrows off the WCF type um, serialization type model, where we've got a, one, one property in here called count, and we've got another one just being the data contract, and that's it. So this is the object with all the details in it that I'd like to store. So if I was to, and I'll come down to set count, so I get a new value coming into this routine. This here is just so that we can get some events coming out through diagnostics. And this is my one line of code that I need. So I don't need to know where it's being saved. I need to know how it's being saved. 
it's all handled by the fabric for me. I can put transactions around this uh, and behind the scenes there's also um, behind the scenes there's also internal caching and then there's there's uh, uh, more persistent type caching um, storage as well down onto the disk. So I don't need to worry about that. I can just come in and say, hey, run my actor, run this particular piece of code. So how do I talk to this guy? And uh, so I will just go there to my client program here. So this is my test client. And my test client has a couple of references to the, the service fabric side of things. And so I've got this notion of an actor proxy. And I then have the create, and we go and uh, uh, we we go and create the uh, a reference to the interface, and we then go and declare a new a new ID. Now this can be a variety of different things. It could be the name of a of a device that you're using. It could be anything at all. Uh, we've got text that we can use, numbers, and new IDs along, and the important part is this particular moniker or this particular address for the application itself. And so after that, we just go off and call the set count. So I go and call it, and we then go and get the counter here as well. So the part, the part at the top up here is my application package. So this Inside here I have a manifest and it tells me a few details about what I'm including and I can come along here and say publish and uh, I can then go and select a, a profile. So is this going to, for example, Azure or is it going to my local cluster and I can then upgrade and, and basically manage the version. So as I hit upgrade on this, uh, sorry, uh, publish. I'll just wait for that guy to continue and now as part of, you can see it's sort of deploying away there and as part of the, the installation, I'm just going to bring this over here for a tick, I get this service Fabric Explorer. So it's running on port 19,080 uh, and uh, there, there is a, a task trade tool that we just didn't see on the, it was on another screen that just pops up and says do you want to go and have a look and see exactly what my cluster is doing. So here's my cluster. I can also go out to any cluster that I have on port 19,080 and uh, you know, go and provided that port's open for me to go and inspect and things. I can go and then have a look and see what my what my uh, different applications are doing. So I've, I've got some applications that are deployed, and here is my stateful actor that, that uh, we've deployed just a moment ago. And I'll just uh, refresh this. So there we go. I've got a couple of other applications here as well. I've also got some system applications which provide things like management, failover naming. So there's some already deployed some system services in here. So let me show you this stateful uh, actor and I need to I need to just refresh this guy. Uh, just over here. Okay. So now I'm just going to see if I can I'm just going to show you uh, a screen and I'll see if we can see it. So I've got I've got details around here. You know, as we sort of click through this guy, I've got uh, details around this. And if I look at my cluster map, you can start to see, you know, things like the upgrade domain and fault domain. Has anyone seen that piece of that that terminology before? And uh, you you may have you may be familiar with this around you know your, your VMs and instances and those sorts of things that are, are sitting in Azure. But when you go to the management portals and the like, so we, we sit here and we've got our nodes living in these particular uh, these particular regions. So each of my five nodes 
this is all running locally on my machine. Each of, and, and I'm just connecting to it through a web interface. So I've got another tool which is a service fabric explorer which I'll show you in just a tick. It's more of a, a you know, desktop based tool. So I've got this, uh, you know, each of these nodes are living in these particular uh, different upgrade domains and fault domains. So if you think about failures and so forth, they're, they're protected, they're isolated within their, same, within their own region. So what I'm about to do is to cause some grief on this. So let's first off, let's see this application run and see what it does. So as far as the, the test client is concerned, so I go and set the counter to be 10, and then while it's less than 10,000, just keep going through this particular loop and output the count value. So, and by the way, I can sit here and I can put a debug breakpoint in any of my code and run it, and uh, you know I can hit that hit that break point in my actors. I just don't have time to do it this morning or today for you. So we're now running and you can start to see that this guy is, I've got the actor ID and I've got a counter that's running. So that the important part here is the number is, is still going up. Let's go and cause some problems. So this is talking to the back end uh, and I'm now going to just bring over the, the Service Fabric Explorer which is this guy here, and I'll just see if I can move this bloke out to there. So just have a look at that, those numbers there. So the interesting part is that this particular actor maintains state, this project maintains state. So if I drill down into here, you can see that my, my primary node, so where this, in this particular instance, um, this is known as a partition, so in this particular instance, the actor I'm talking to is running on node two, and that's the primary. And I've also got two active secondaries, and we get some details about these. So I'm not really interested in the, the secondaries, right? So if you think about it, in, in Azure, it's exactly the same scenario where your VMs, for example, your, your, your blob storage, you've got three copies at any one time. There's a primary and two secondaries. Now we can control this here. We could say that, you know what, I want you to have five copies. Of, of this particular replica uh, because that's how I feel safe. I don't want you to have just three copies. So we can set that up in part of the application um, configuration details that uh, I sort of skipped over at the moment. So what I'm going to do is remove the secondary. So I'm just basically going to take it off the air like the node went down or whatever the story might be. So you'll notice over on the right hand side that the numbers are still going up and there's an idle secondary that's come in. So Service Fabric has decided to elect uh, you know, another secondary and it's, it's in the process of being built and I'm just sort of hoping to get there so that we can see it come back. There you go. So now it's back up and running. So the numbers kept going and that's fine, right? Because you think about it, the primary is the guy that we're really interested in. So let's remove the primary. Let's kill it. So our application now has has died. Now the numbers just kept going. Okay, these numbers just kept going. So I'll destroy the primary again. So it's trying to make our application a lot more resilient. If you think about it. So now there's our our oh beautiful. Just to be quick on some of those calls, but um, you can see in the back end our our, our uh, numbers just kept going. So that gets quite interesting. I'll just uh, I'll just stop that because now we're suddenly building this up with state and resilience. So how do I maintain this state? This dot state, which is taken from whatever that that object there is, and I set it. I read it. So in in get in in the get, I can just read it. I don't have to worry about please save it for me. Please stick it into a database and and the like. So that's, um, look, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, programming paradigm as well. So I'm just going to switch back to the slides for a moment and continue on because I do want to show you a few things further. Uh, let me, okay, should be back. Great. So we saw a, a quick sort of demo there. Now we have this notion of, a, of an application. So the application has some code and it's also got a config which tells the, the, the service fabric how it should execute our application. 
So these particular applications go into something called a package. Sorry, the, the code and the config go into something called a package. And our packages can be independently versioned and deployed within our application. So we have an application which gives us versioning, isolation. So think of them as services. And they, one package can go into uh, the, the application. We've also got a, another package that can also go into the application as well. And we can then deploy that as a, as a, a single unit if we want. So they, they end up having their own types and they've all got their own code and config and this is what makes up our application that gives us our level of isolation. So how do we, how do we execute the, these particular uh, applications and start them up? So we have our service type which is like a, a CLR you know, type, class type. We have our application type that gives us uh, the you know, for example, the fabric counter application is the, is the application type. And then if we want to get to each service, we can reference that through a particular unique address there just down at the bottom. And as far as the deployment is concerned, then they can go into our separate nodes as and when, however, the, the cluster sees fit, and then we can you know, deploy them out you know, how they run and where they run and what nodes, we're not really that interested in. You know, or, or maybe we are. But, uh, you know, the fabric looks after, after that for us. So the part that really makes it, uh, you know, drives it home for us is that we're, we're familiar with collections. You know, in terms of our programming model, we have collections. We have also have concurrent collections which is part of, uh, you know, you're familiar with, right, that, that we start to get into multi-threaded. Now, in terms of service fabric, we have our reliable collections. And uh, they basically can span multiple nodes. They're very similar to what we saw just a moment ago where we have a primary, then we have, have replicas. They're, they're asynchronous. We can get to They're persistent. They're durable. So as far as my programming model is concerned, I basically just can come along with my normal code, my normal stateless code of a website, for example, and start to use these reliable collections to hold things like my user profiles, my shopping trolleys, and, and those sorts of things. So then we sort of move into things like reliable services, APIs, and uh, you know, building stateful services or stateful actors and what would that look like? So I have a, a typical, you know, on the left-hand side, I have typical sort of uh, model where I've got, you know, maybe my cloud point APIs. And I've also got, uh, you know, a, a web app or some web endpoint. I've got some worker processes underneath. I may or may not have a queue that, that relates to them. Uh, and then maybe I want some storage a bit later on down the track, which may be, you know, no SQL, Azure DB, but I have to manage all of this, right, Azure tables. If you look at what we have over on Service Fabric Land, uh, I have a, a web app, web endpoint that could be stateless. I could run a thousand instances of those things. And then, and then I've got my stateful service, and that's it. The lines of code that you saw just a moment ago are exactly it. Uh, so, I'm just going to flick to, all right, so I'm just going to, I've got, uh, got a very similar one as well, except uh, this particular demo, I'll just select my cloud, I'll publish that guy. So I'm just deploying now into the uh, service fabric through Azure. And this particular one maintains state, and I get back events. So this is uh, a very similar scenario, except uh, here I've got a class which is my game state, and I've got uh, certain details about you know my invaders. I've got a ship, and that that's about it. Okay, I've got a couple of lists in there. So I've just sort of expanded on this model a little bit more, and let's go and run it and just show you what this is. So this, once again, is a native client. 
So it's a client living on, on the service fabric, you know, on my machine, where I'm talking directly to service fabric. So I'm not actually going through awesome. all this news. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's battle hardened client code. And when in doubt, I'll just modify this for a moment. And let's just swallow that exception, shall we? On error, resume next. Great demo magic. And uh, let's just see how we go. Um, okay, great. So here, here I've just got a simple console app, and I thought I'd just do something a little bit different. This one is getting events coming back from the actor that uh, is looking after the management of this particular game. And so I've got my, my ship here down the bottom that I can move. And I, what I do is basically tell the actor to maintain the state of the game. So all of the state is in the game, in the actor, and it's just eventing me back saying, here's the current position of these sorts of things. So that there is, is running away, and I haven't done collision testing just yet. But at the moment, I can only, uh, I can only uh, fire one missile at a time. And I'm going to keep this guy, am I going to keep him running? Yeah, I'll keep him running because uh, I do, I'm just going to move him over to a different screen because I do want to um, upgrade that in place at the moment. So look, I'll, I'll give you all the, all the uh, code and everything else, but there's I'd like to move on to clusters here, which is just talking about how these things are deployed. So in terms of the service fabric, we're, we're drilling down into the purple bar again even further. And so we've got things like management, we've got communications, we've got reliability. We've got all these different subsystems in service fabric to ensure that my code is up and running. And uh, the part that I quite like is the whole um, upgradability. But before we go there, we've got some, some nodes. We've got five or so nodes in our particular um, cluster. Now, this is at the very beginning. We may get a failure on, on these between these two particular nodes. And a new node then gets automatically created. And the cluster then gets re on the fly reconfigured to go and take advantage of that particular no, uh, that particular failure and the new node then pops into the cluster. So this is stuff that we know, it, you know, you may be familiar with on how Azure clusters work or, you know, when we deploy our VMs, it just happens in the background. But now we've got the ability to include this into our applica application space for free and we don't have to necessarily worry about it too much. So let me just show you what this looks like in terms of a classic sort of model, you know, programming model that we have. And that is that, you know, we're familiar with our three-tier applications. We've got load balancers, we've got our, our front end, we've got some stateless middle tier, we've got some storage that goes on. And that works really well. But what about, you know, under scale? What about if this thing starts to get busy? We scale out each of these tiers. So then we might say, well, you know what? We need to decouple between the web front end and our worker role processing it. So let's go and use a queue of sorts. It could be, you know, Azure queues, it could be, um, you know, service bus queues, whatever it might be, right? Um, storage queues, things like this. And that works well. And then suddenly between our two worker processes, we'd like to, you know, introduce another queue of sorts. And, you know, this thing starts to get quite complicated pretty quickly. And if you think about all the work that you're doing, you're doing you know, a lot of foundational and plumbing type, you know, scaffolding type work rather than why are you built the system in the first place. And then, you know, we may go and introduce a cache of sorts a bit later on down the track. And I just spent the last seven months doing exactly this in a project of, you know, introducing a cache and optimizing latency and, and performance and call times. And if it's not in the cache, then go and fetch it from storage type logic. Whereas, you know, if we, we, we think about what this looks like um, in terms of our Azure Fabric, service fabric, sorry, uh, scenario, 
we've still got the same stateless web front end, and then we've got our stateful middle tier. So they could be services, they could be be actors, whatever they may be. This whole thing could be in Service Fabric, so I can host my my web sites in Owen type scenario, and that's it. That is my model. If I need you know, low latency, it's there. If I need you know, persistence, durability, it's there. So I don't need to have anything more around this. And I've got you know, scaling out. It can scale out across the, the cluster for me if I need to. And beautiful. <clears throat> and I've got transactions as well. So I've got built-in transactions that you know, maybe I want to update several stateful objects at once. That uh, you know, I've got a banking type uh, account. I've got two bank accounts that I'm working with, and uh, I want to you know withdraw from one and deposit in another. Absolutely. So we've got our, our transactional support, which is really important. Think about building this. Very very simple. I've also got diagnostics and and other things that come out the back end, so that uh, if you think about you know in Azure, you've got your your instances, your web apps, your VMs, whatever it may be running. And you can go and say, hey, give me some diagnostic information about that, and you'll go and process it today as you normally would. This can happen out of your service fabric. So um, in terms of you know, the, what a, a microservice is, what a stateful microservice is, it's just a, a definition there that I, I decided to uh, include. So we've got these things like replica sets. So let's just explore a little bit more on that for the moment. So in terms of a stateful microservice, uh, so we've got state being, uh, we've got our, our primary and then we've got various secondaries distributed around our cluster for durability. And we saw that in the tool just a little while ago. And uh, so, you know, that's when we had the counter service and I destroyed it and then we basically, uh, you know, saw it keep running. So we, we had the, the notion of replication. So the service fabric will, will perform high-speed replication through to the different secondaries. With the latest release that was just released four or five days ago, we're able to control what, out of the state, what pieces of that state, so maybe I've got a large state that I'm storing, what pieces are replicated when. So rather than just you know replicate out everything upon a very small change, we can control and dictate what replication, what work gets replicated when. So look, there's some very interesting things around this. So let's have a look at just the replication side. If we're performing a read, all reads go to the primary. And then we just get back the value right, of, of that particular state. Now, if we're performing a write, then the writes go out to the secondaries um, automatically. So they all go out as part of a, a transactional and then the secondaries come back and they say, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, yes, I acknowledge, I'm, I'm done, I'm good, I'm good. And you'll notice that there's one secondary there out of the four secondaries that haven't responded yet. Maybe just you know, a fraction slower or whatever. Now the primary says, that's good enough for me. I've got the majority of the secondaries that have said, yes, they've acknowledged. And then a bit later on, the slow secondary will respond back. So it needs that, that majority. Uh, so I've also got things like the reconfiguration side. So what happens, you know, the, the part we're interested in is what happens if the primary goes down? So the primary disappears, right? And that's what we just went and did. So a secondary gets promoted to a primary and uh, it starts just business as usual, as we saw in the tool. Now, if my secondary fails, we don't really care. A new secondary comes up. We, we bring a new secondary into the replica, and uh, that'll happen shortly. Now, in this case, the original primary just came back into the loop again. It had a glitch, whatever it might have happened. It says, hey, I, I was primary here. Now, the new primary says, bad luck, son, and you then become a secondary. And in terms of a brand new secondary coming up on board, we build it, there's a, there's a notion of I'm building, so the replica, the state information is being replicated over to it until it's up to speed, up to state, correct state, and then it becomes a secondary and uh, falls 
in line again. So falls in line, it's now up to, up to date and uh, it's continued business as usual. So this is stuff that you get for free. Okay, so in terms of cascading failures and so on, there's all these checks and balances. This is five year old technology in terms of the functionality there. So, you know, it, it's well baked in. I don't need, you know, Windows cluster services set up on my machine. It's all very self contained within my, uh, within my, the, the service fabric. So there I've got, as far as the replica states are concerned, I've got, you know, things like primary, active secondaries, idle secondaries, and none. Okay. So we, we went and caused chaos just a moment ago by destroying things and you know, seeing them run by removing those out of, the, uh, out of the group. And just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just wanting to show you the, the upgrade of applications. So as far as our applications are concerned, you're familiar with the, the upgrade domains and uh, we deploy out our different applications to different um, nodes and, and they sit within their own container. So we can see these uh, these applications living there and uh, they're in their own containers and also so I've just had PowerPoint uh, do the PowerPoint's just died on me here folks so uh, now for a word from our sponsors um, all right, so while we're, while we're waiting on, on that, I'm just going to show you the, great, oh, you're there, okay. Let me just get to the slide that I'm interested in. And And One day somebody right. will make highly available PowerPoint, Mick, and then will be everything will be perfect. Oh, wouldn't, it? wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love it? <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see how this goes. Okay, great. So, how do I upgrade my application with zero downtime? And uh, so, things like I've got various applications deployed, active services, you know, state, whatever it might be, and uh, I've got you know, fault domain one and I've got upgrade domains, as you can see. And so the service fabric will go about upgrading these uh, through the, you know, in order of the upgrade domains and uh, fault domains and things like this. So you can start to see that it'll, it'll oh, where are you? there we go, it'll, it'll perform an upgrade and it becomes quite interesting. So I'm going to show you that um, in the flesh. So let's, Let's go and do this with zero downtime, and I've I've got two to show you before I before I wrap up. So here's our game. Now you can see there's a few little bits and pieces I need to tweak out of it. So when I move the console screen, this uh, it doesn't fully refresh. So I'm going to bring up a uh, I'm going to bring up a I can do this out of Visual Studio. So I'm just going to bring up a a PowerShell window. For a tick, let me just come back to you. There we go. Sorry about that. And all right, great. So I'm just going to. I could do this in Visual Studio, but what I want to do is show it to you in PowerShell, so that uh, you can see what goes on. Now, what I've done is gone and modified my application. So I've got a client that's connected. Right, so client's connected to Service Fabric by a proxy, and in Service Fabric, I've got my my application that's been deployed, and that's the. We'll just have a quick quick squeeze at that for a moment, and that is the uh, Spacey's game time. So you can start to see here it's in orange. I haven't done anything to it, but it's sort of giving me an impression that the the secondary here is uh, you know is in there's something up with it. It's not 100% there. It's, I've got one active secondary, and I've got an idle secondary. So you know, shortly it'll be self-healing and recover from this. So it's good to see that actually 
in uh, you know in, in a presentation. So I've got my my Spaces game and I've got version 1.0 deployed. And you you can see there that I'm living on these particular nodes and I've got my upgrade domain center there. And I've got other details about this as well. So I'm now going to perform an upgrade. And what I've done is is I've got a new package. So I've got this package. I don't need Visual Studio. I've given I've given uh, you know the package out to someone, and let's go and start doing an upgrade. So we're now starting an upgrade, and this is Visual Studio. Uh, sorry, this is PowerShell. I didn't want to just sort of do deploy magic. It's very easy out of Visual Studio. Don't get me wrong, um, but I did want to show you just in PowerShell, just to show you that you know we can use a variety of different tools. Now what this upgrade gives me is the ability to have multiple bullets um, and uh, they change color as well. So you can see there that, that the client has stopped. So what, what uh, is happening is it's still going on in the background, but this particular client is, is uh, built on top of events coming out of Service Fabric. And the events that come out of Service Fabric aren't necessarily guaranteed to be delivered. So I'm just waiting on on the, the sort of the end of an uh, event pipe, and uh, so there's my bullet running. And uh, I'll just see if I can I can uh, see I've I've sort of hit the the space bar a bit. So we're just upgrading. So in the it's merely my window to the application that is. Uh, uh, just paused here for the moment and hopefully I should see a bullet come out shortly. So there we go. So I've, I've now got, hopefully you can see that on your screen, but uh, I've now got the ability to have up to five some bizarre things going on there. So I've got my, my bullets. Oh, there you go. I've got one that's blue, which is and there, I've now got multi, uh, you know, multi bullet firing so in the application. So I've managed to upgrade it, and there's a few bits around the actual nature of a console application in the first place. But uh, look, that that has been upgraded in place while it's actually up and running. So if you think about that, and and you can see there, I've now got a, a new version. Uh, I can look at my application view and I should be able to see that I've got uh, multiple versions there we go. over here. So there it is there and you can see that there's my two versions running in or, or present in Service Fabric. And if I was a client that did need a particular version type, I could do that you know, as well. So think about these actors. What, what we do a lot of the time is use these actors to, to uh, pull messages off an event hub and process them. So these scale as my, you know, as my service, as demand scale so that we can control the number of actors or you know, in this case they're responding to just the client, the, the client uh, um, demand but you know, we can spin them up based on the number of messages and, and things like that that are present within, uh, within the the queue, for example, service fabric. So what I'd like to do now is just show you one other in-place demo as well. I'm just going to get the, I'm just going to get, uh, where are you? Uh, right, that's him. Okay. So this is just the other, let me just get this right on the screen. Um, this is the other demo that I just wanted to show you as well. So this here is, is done slightly differently. It's a, a web API sitting at the front of a service fabric application. And the service fabric application maintains state for all of these objects. And the browser has some 3D uh, client libraries in there. So the state comes back from the web service call. Think of it as a JSON call. 
and then the, the browser is the thing that draws these particular polygons and things like that. So in this particular case, what I'd like to do is to upgrade this guy as well. And uh, so in terms of, you know, it goes without saying that in terms of, uh, you know, durability, fault tolerance, I can, I can destroy the nodes that this application is running in and, and so on. Now this where we're upgrading. So what this will do is, as it's performing its upgrade, it will make these objects rotate. So as part of the back end, it'll update the state and rotate the polygon of space. Uh, and uh, I'm basically making a call to a web service and seeing, you know, getting the, the JSON results out. Now, while that thing is running, I'm performing an upgrade, and you can now see that they're starting to rotate. So think, of that, think about that for your back-end services. And now the, the upgrade is complete, and they're running. So how handy would that be as part of our, our back-end services to be able to just upgrade those on the fly? Um, and we can also control how the upgrade occurs. So, you know, from node to node, or whether it's you know, we do it manually, etc. And I just wanted to jump into, lastly, the Azure Fabric over here, that the portal. And I can now start to create, <coughs> maybe, uh, if I go to New, you would be great. So if I go to New, I can then go and, and um, create a Service Fabric cluster. And uh, I'll just go over here. And it remembers where I, I lastly was. Let me just pick my subscription and demo SF cluster. So exactly what I've been showing you on uh, on my local machine, I can now go off and start to build as uh, as part of I'll just call it that as part of a, a an Azure portal cluster. Now, the other interesting thing here is that as it stands at the moment, the, the product team has given me five VMs as a minimum that I need to you know, have this self-managed cluster uh, where, you know, there. So I did ask them about that recently, and um, that was just something they felt comfortable with at this point in time. Now, what I can do is spin up a VM and go and install a, a dev cluster very similar to what I've got here at you know running on my local machine. I've also the the uh, uh, also with with uh, security I can set up all various sorts of certificate encryption. I can set up uh, the the vault key vault encryption here as well, so that it can be how to connect. So I can lock this down with uh, um, the um, how to connect to the nodes, but also how to deploy to the nodes, and how each node talks within each, you know, to each other within the cluster. So I'm just going to specify this as unsecure, uh, just make it easy for this particular. Uh, oh no, not you. And I'll hit OK on that. Beautiful. And we can then go off and hit. All right. Okay. He looks good. Already have. All right. Let's do it again. Right. Uh huh. Handy. All right. We'll do that. Um, and in preview, so it's available in a few regions only. So it's off doing doing a deployment. That's going to take a little while. And the thing behind this bit is that exactly that once it's all up and running, exactly the same uh, URL, the same deployment. So this this particular uh, desktop tool, for example, I can come along and say connect, go and connect to a particular cluster, and it's exactly the same. That uh, you know I'll I'll be then managing. I'll be managing the same cluster, you know, a cloud-based cluster as I am locally, 
from within my Visual Studio, I'll just bring up uh, a Visual Studio here for a moment. From my application, if I decide to say publish, I can select a different publishing profile known as the cloud. I can specify my endpoint and same again. So the tooling is, is very, very handy. Out of Visual Studio, I also get a service little tool down here. I get a service fabric cluster explorer, which allows me to you know, go and see what's happening um, in the you know, in the application space. I can go and you know view some diagnostics that's happening through there. You know, so it's quite a rich environment, which uh, is very very handy. But um, folks, hopefully you know, hopefully you get to see and appreciate uh, what's going on here with Service Fabric because. You know, as as I sort of maintained, we've got things like logging. I haven't really touched on a lot of the, the logging aspects of it, but uh, you know, generally my logging is always available for me. Uh, things like uh, you know scale, and then we just go back to this, this particular picture again, which is uh, you know we start off with a great idea, right? And we've got our features, and this is exactly what we want to build. How much of this other stuff can we just push aside? And have the have you know the frameworks and the and the fabrics do for us. So, uh, look, thanks very much for your time, um, and uh, it's been great, folks. So, uh, been lovely to be here, and uh, thank you for your time in the evening or wherever wherever you may be.